which has a program for single women. It is called Embrace Grace. And it provides oil changes, tire repair, and so forth for free. The women are to call Fruit Cove Baptist and make an appointment to receive an evaluation of what their car may need. As women interact with them, they also receive a flyer from MLC that has been made up telling about the baby cancer. Now, let me tell you what needs to be done to enhance our ministry because we are only helping two families right now. We are in need of single mothers that are in need of whatever youngsters need. A concern that has become apparent is that we haven't been able to draw single mothers from the most desperate areas in Jacksonville or St. John County. I realize that we are an older congregation, although I'm pretty sure that us older folks probably have younger uh, mothers within our families or might even work with them. A suggestion that I have is please take a flyer and ask a friend if they know of someone. God has provided, and we need our hands and mouths to continue his work. God bless you all, and thank you. Spirit. By water and your word, 
You claim us as daughters and sons, making us heirs of your promise and servants of all. <clears throat> we praise you for the gift of water that sustains life, and above all, we praise you for the gift of new life in Jesus Christ. Shower us with your Spirit and renew our lives with your forgiveness, grace, and love. To you be given honour and praise through Jesus Christ our Lord, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. <clears throat>
that fruit has anything to do with the Bible? I put a picture here of fruit. You want to see that? And I'm going to show you the rest of it. <coughs> Just, which one is your favorite? Do you have a favorite fruit? Oranges? Oh, I like oranges too. And I like grapes. They grew too on them. Yeah? Well, can you imagine having a fruit tree in your yard that doesn't ever have any fruit? What good is the tree? In? Well, maybe it can be good for shade, but it's not really good for anything else, right? Well, in today's story, Jesus, in today's Bible, this is Jesus tells a story about a man who had a fig tree. And the fig tree didn't bear any fruit. So the man said to the person who was tending his garden, chop it down. And the man said, no, don't do that. Give me one more year. Let me help and see if I can make it bear fruit. He was good, wasn't he? He gave the tree another chance. You know, Jesus does that with us. Jesus asks us to be kind and loving. Those are the fruits that we do. We are being kind, we be loving, when we help people to live in peace with each other, like when we say sorry when we hurt other people. Those are the kind of fruits that he gives. Oh, you got a boo here? Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry for that. And Jesus is sorry too. And Jesus is sorry when we uh, hurt, well, Jesus asks us to be sorry when we hurt other people. So those are the fruits that we bear. But you know what? Even if instead of saying sorry or if we are being mean or nasty to someone, we can ask them to forgive us, but we must also ask God to forgive us, and then God gives us a second chance. Isn't that nice? Isn't that good news for us? Yeah. So let's pray and ask God to help us this week. Can you say after me, thank you, Father, for giving us a second chance to live more like Jesus? Every day. Every day. In Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus name we pray. Amen. Amen. Would you like to take this picture with me? No? Okay. Let's go back to our seats. We'll continue with the lesson. A reading from Isaiah. Ho, oh, everyone who thirsts, come to the lodgers. And you that have no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me, and eat what is good, and delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear, and come to me. Listen, so that you may live. I will make you with an everlasting covenant, my steadfast, sure love for David. See, I made him a witness to the people, a leader and commander for the people. See, you shall call nations that you do not know, and nations that you do not know, you shall run to, they shall run to you, because of the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel. For he has glorified you. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. 
Let the wicked forsake their way and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them return to the Lord that he may have mercy on them and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Word of God, word of God. Thanks be to God. A reading from 1 Corinthians. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, that our ancestors were all under the cloud, and all passed through the sea. And all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. And all ate the same spiritual food. And all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them. And the rock was Christ. Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them. And they were struck down in the wilderness. Now these things occurred as examples for us, so that we might not desire evil as they did. Do not become idolaters, as some of them did. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink, and they rose up to play. We must not indulge in sexual immortality, as some of them did, and 23,000 fell in a single day. We must not put Christ to the test, as some of them did, and were destroyed by serpents. And do not complain, as some of them did, and were destroyed by the destroyer. These things happened to them to serve as an example. And they were written down to instruct us on whom the ends of the ages have come. So if you think you are standing, watch out that you do not fall. No testing has overtaken you that is not common to everyone. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tested beyond your strength. But with the testing, he will also provide the way out so that you may be able to endure it. Word of God, word of life. Gospel of the Lord. Praise you, Lord Christ. 
You may be seated. <coughs> It was an extraordinary thing for us pastoring churches in the fall of 2001. <coughs> the World Trade Center towers had fallen. The entire wing of Pentagon was laying charred wreckage. Yellow caution tape still outlined the site near Shakespeare, Pennsylvania, where the plane crashed. And American centuries were full. It continued for several weeks. All through the remainder of September and October. But every week we noticed less and less people in our centuries. Well before Thanksgiving weekend, attendance was back to what it was before September 11th. What have we just experienced, we asked ourselves at the time. Was this a spiritual revival? Well, if it was, it was very short. The shock of September 11 attacks propelled many Americans back to their religious roots seeking consolation. But soon as the shock of the event wore off, it was back to business as usual. Now we are more than 20 years beyond that day. Did you realize that there is no student in school alive today that was even born in that time? This far out from the disaster, what, if anything, have we learned as a nation from these experiences? What have we learned as individuals about our spiritual life? I dare to say the short answer is absolutely nothing. Well, that conclusion already was made five years after the event when Christian pollster uh, George Bonner completed a massive study of American religious life. Bonner and his team of researchers interviewed over 8,600 people and they studied three areas of religious activity, five areas that were indicated of religious belief, three areas pertaining to spiritual commitment, and eight areas related to faith identity. And they found that all of these indicators of faith are virtually identical to the norms prior to September 11, 2001. This horrific event may have driven Americans into churches, but clearly what the church had to offer by way of encouragement and consolation was not enough to keep them there. What do we make of it? Let's look at today's gospel lesson. Some people come to Jesus and ask a very difficult theological question. A horrific event had just happened in the temple in Jerusalem. There was some rioting in the city. In retaliation, Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor of the time, sent a detail of soldiers right into the temple where they put several worshippers to the sword. Luke calls them the murdered victims, the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifice. In other words, this was an act of state-sponsored terrorism. And the people want Jesus to address the meaning of the terrible temple slaughter. Their question is the same as the one that we who gathered in churches on September 16, 2001 asked. And that is why. 
Jesus answers their question with a different question. Do you think that because these Galileans suffered in this way, that they were worse sinners than all other Galileans? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will perish just as they do. So I ask you the question, do you think that those people who perished in the, t in the Twin Towers or in the Pentagon or on Flight 93 were worse sinners than the rest of us Americans? Of course they were not. Bond traders peering into their computers, naval officers sipping coffee around the table, workers collecting dirty dishes at restaurants, firefighters ascending smoking staircases. All of these people who perished were no worse sinners than anyone else. God did not single them out for punishment on that day. They suffered and died simply because they were in that place at that time. The thought that death can visit us suddenly and unexpectedly, just as it did on that day on September 11, makes us reflect, sure. Yet, it yields no simple explanation that I can discern. A colleague of mine used to put it this way, Anna, it's life. And you know it just is. Why do some people die and others don't? We don't really know the answer to that. But again, we delve into the scriptures and here in Luke 13, Jesus refers to a second incident. Well known probably to his listeners, although nowhere in history can we find what really happened at this Tower of Siloam. Jesus asks his listeners, or those 18 who were killed when the tire, Tower of Siloam fell on him, do you think that they were worse offenders than all the others living in Jerusalem? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will perish just as they do. As I said, we know nothing about the collapse of the tower. Jesus' comment about it is the only historical record that we have. Yet in a city like Jerusalem that had many towers for protection and defense, many ramparts around it, we could think that one of those towers collapsed while there were people standing nearby, or perhaps even in the tower, crushing the life out of 18 innocents. Maybe those people thought just as others did in New York. What if I'd be standing under the tower that day? This could just as well have been me. Plenty of people are asking that same question even now, after last June's collapse of the condominium apartment tower in Surfside, Florida. It seems so terrifyingly random. One moment those residents of that upscale condominium building were asleep in the bed and the next moment half of the building simply fell apart. There was no earthquake. There was no hurricane. Just the domino effect of a whole series of flaws in the building's construction and the exacerbated years of deferred maintenance. Did those people deserve to die? would say by no stretch of the imagination. Some people in that condominium survived, but that was only because 
their uh, apartments were on the other side of the building. And then there were those who didn't even live there. They were only there for a short-term visit, visiting friends or using a friend's condominium for a few days of vacation. Who died? And there are those who are quick after hearing shocking incidents of moral and natural evil to try and find an explanation. We want to blame someone for these things. Some of this theological second guessing went on immediately after 9-1-1. Just two days after the attacks, Jerry Falwell was a guest on Pat Robinson's show, The 700 Club. He said, and I'm going to read you the exact words. I really believe that the pagans and the abortionists and the feminists and the gays and the lesbians who are actively trying to make an alternative lifestyle, the ACLU, People for the American Way, all of them who have tried to secularize America, I point the finger in their face and say, you helped this happen. Well, later he did apologize for those words, but 22 years later, it still kindles a flame of anger in me. And what's worse is Pat Robertson, the host of this program nodded his saying, I completely conquer. When I think of those words that were spoken over the airwaves, I think that they are amongst the worst obscenities that were ever spoken. Yeah, while the ruins of the trade center were still smoldering, rescue workers were risking their lives searching in the rubble for survivors. These two complacent preachers were sitting in an air-conditioned TV studio, pontificating that God wiped out all those people to frighten certain other people into living differently. <clears throat> what have we learned from September 11? Well, according to Falwell and Robertson, we are learning that those people, not us, my people, those people have to repent. Jesus does talk about repentance in Luke 13, but not in this way. Jesus explicitly declares that these disasters from that time of Jesus to our time today are not punishments for sin. The Galileans murdered by Pilate's thugs and the people crushed to death by falling masonry were no worse sinners than anyone else. Yet Jesus goes on to say that we all of us ought to repent when we hear of these disasters. Because these disasters demonstrate how fragile life can be and how dependent we always are on the grace of God. Rebecca Solnit an author wrote in 2020 an article in Britain's Guardian newspaper about what disasters teach us. Of course, as you can expect or suspect, it was about the coronavirus pandemic. She writes, the word crisis means in medical terms, the crossroads a patient reaches. The point at which he or she will either take the road to recovery or the road to death. The word emergency comes from emergence or emerge. As if you were ejected from the familiar and urgently need to reorient. Our focus shifts 
And what matters shifts. We ourselves change as our priorities shift, as I intensify the weariness of mortality makes us wake up our own lives and the preciousness of life. Maybe our chief learning from experiences of disaster is discovering that other version of who we are. It's in those times that we become either really good or really bad. It's as C.S. Lewis famously said, God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks in our consciences, but shouts in our pain. It is God's megaphone to rouse a deaf world. So we ask ourselves, does God contrive massive disasters simply for the purpose of getting through to us? Is the price of that spiritual megaphone so dear even to Almighty God that it can be measured only in dozens and thousands of human lives being snuffed out? The answer is a resounding no. Again, I say we do not know why the Lord allows disasters to happen. This I do know, that on the night when that building collapsed, God did not come down from heaven and hold it up until somebody started maintaining the building. Sometimes disasters happen because of decisions we make or don't make. Sometimes disasters happen simply because that is life. We live in a broken world. There's another thing that I'm very sure of, that God is present with us and to us in the midst of it all. The Presbyterian Church has a brief statement of faith that starts with these words, in life and in death, we belong to God. Paul wrote, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. That is the lesson that we learn from September 11 disasters, Hurricane Katrina disasters, Surfside Tower collapsing disasters, and any other disasters that lead to massive loss of life. We learn also from these disasters how dependent we all are every minute of every day on the presence and the power of God in our lives. Something we should never forget. It's a lesson I think we all started learning right after September 11, but then all too soon forgot. So here as we are in the middle of Lent, we hear once again Jesus' call to repentance. And the call to repentance is so clear. It is a call to all of us. Not just to those others. We all need to reflect and examine ourselves. We all need to turn our lives around, begin again, and to seek to live our lives more faithfully as we follow Christ. Amen. Mm -hmm.
confess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I thank you, God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended to heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. And he will come to judge the living and the dead. And I am in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, the world of the heaven and the rest. Drawn close to the heart of God, we offer these prayers to the church, the world, and all who are in need. We pray for the church around the world in all its form, for pastors, deacons, bishops, chaplains, and mission developers, for church councils, committee chairs, and all lay ministry leaders, for congregations that contemplate difficult decisions about the future of their ministry. Merciful God, for the health of this planet and the well-being of its creatures, for lands impacted by droughts and at risk of wildfires, for fig trees and vineyards that produce fruit for our nourishment and delight, for animal habitats threatened by climate change, merciful God, receive our prayer. For those called into positions of civic responsibility, for judges, attorneys, and court administrators, tasked with uncovering truth and delivering justice. For activists and community leaders who cast a vision of a more compassionate and equitable society. Merciful God, For those who call upon you for mercy, for all who live in poverty and experience hunger, for any who feel tested beyond their strength, for those who are hospitalized or near death, and for all in need of healing, especially Austin, Barbara, Bert Baker, Betty Gerson, Brandon Traver, Brenda, Charlotte Dustin, Chuck Swain, Dave, Dick, Dustin and Cindy Darby, Earl, Edson, Shante, and Sequila, Esther Lopez, Gomez, Greg, Hal, Ismail, Hal Wieland, Keith Schrock, Kelly Feinfeld, Kim, Leanne Owen, Marie, Melissa, Morgan, Pam, Philip, Ron Smith, Roy Hatton, Ruth, Sue, Teresa, Thomas Alfred, Tom Traver, the Turknet family, the people of Ukraine, the family and friends of Evelina Bibble, Karen McCree, Melanie Duros, <coughs> Teresa and Roy DeCamps, and all those we mention in our hearts and on our lips. Merciful God, for the advocacy efforts of this congregation, for those whose faith leads them to speak to the cultures and engage in difficult conversations with policymakers, for those who promote mercy over vengeance or retaliation, merciful God, who seek our prayers, for those whose earthly journeys have ended, we give thanks. With all the saints, we praise you for the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life of the last. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Accept the prayers we bring, O God, on behalf of the world in need, for the sake of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 The peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you. We share the peace with those who are just leaving your family bubble and you stand away from the rest. You may be seated.
You have blessed us with the fullness of creation. Now we gather at your feast, where you offer us the food that satisfies. Take and use what we offer here. Come among us and feed us with the body and blood of Christ. In whose name we pray. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. May us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is Christ we are thanks and praise. This is the view of God of the universe. Your mercy is everlasting and your faithfulness endures from age to age. Praise to you for creating the heavens and the earth. Praise to you for saving the earth from the waters of the flood. Praise to you for bringing the Israelites safely through the sea. Praise to you for leading your people through the wilderness to the land of milk and honey. Praise to you for the words and deeds of Jesus, your anointed one. Praise to you for the death and resurrection of Christ. Praise to you for your spirit poured out on all nations. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. And he gave thanks and broke it and gave it to his disciples and take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. <coughs> Again after supper he took the cup. And he gave thanks and gave it to them to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this. In remembrance of me. With this bread and cup, we remember our Lord's Passover from death to life as we proclaim the mystery of him. Christ is the God, Christ is the Christ is the Lord. The God of resurrection and new life, pour out your Holy Spirit on us and these gifts of bread and wine. Bless this feast. Grace our table with your presence. Come, come, Holy Spirit. Reveal yourself to us in the breaking of the brain. Raise us up as the body of Christ for the world. Breathe new life into us. Send us forth, burning with justice, peace, and love. Come, come Holy Spirit. With your holy ones of all times and places, with the earth and all its creatures, with sun and moon and stars, we praise you, O God, this and holy trinity, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us praise Jesus taught us. Our Lord, 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 Take 